Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, August 15th, 2021, are these. The first reading in the thematic department is Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. Or the first reading in the semi-continuous department is 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, and then chapter 3, 3 through 14. Psalm 34, 9 through 14. Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. That would be the second reading. And the gospel reading, John 6, 51 through 58. Happy fourth Sunday in Bread of Life, you two. We're still missing uh, Joy J. Moore, our friend and colleague, who's taking the summer off from podcasting to uh, do other things, which we support but miss her. But hang in there. We're hoping to get her back in September. We are indeed. And uh, yes, happy Bread of Life to you both indeed. fourth Sunday. This is where and it gets interesting. It does, doesn't it? Like, yeah. This is... This is uh, this does get interesting. Uh, and I was reading on a on Facebook something along the lines of of uh, the already pastors are preachers are uh, looking to this and saying they really don't want to do this. So by now, like the fourth Sunday in, they're like, why did I decide to stay in in John six? But you did. Here you are, and Wait, I'm, they did. Well, they did. I mean, if you're, well, maybe oh. they didn't, I don't know. Maybe they're like, they're, they're going to tolerate the next, you know, 10 minutes or so, and then move on to what they want to preach. But I want to remind preachers that sticking with the bread of life dis discourse is uh, the length of it, I know is tiresome and a bit overwhelming, but it is it's indicative of the larger theme in John of this, of this abiding. Really, it's a, you know, it's an and and we're getting that language here, uh, in verse fifty six. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me. And that really, uh, when we think about this discourse and we think about uh, the discourses overall in John, they are all an invitation to life. Uh, and and full life and abundant life with Jesus and uh, and if you look at how uh, frequently the repetition is of life or living in this particular section, that's indicative, right? So I will give for the life of the world. I will raise them up on the last day, which is a promise of eternal life once Jesus has, has ascended to the Father. The living Father, I live because um, uh, I live because of the Father. Whoever eats me will live and will live forever. So that's the first point that I want to make is that you this this abiding, uh, this this discourse is, and Jesus as the bread of life is an offering of life and to share in all of Jesus' life. And uh, that's also the reference of flesh here in uh, verse 51. You cannot read that and not go back to 114, right? The word became flesh. And so uh, I think making some of those connections here uh, would be one direction you could take homiletically. That notion of abiding, I think, is so important. It's it's often heard passively because that English word can mean so many things. It has a sense of entering into rest, you know, and and being comforted. Um, as I read John, though, it has much more of a dynamic quality to it of being of being called into life, of being called into relationship, of being called into this bond of love. That, uh, that Jesus shares with the God that he calls father, that there's, there's something purposeful about it, right? Something that, that involves agency, that involves the work that God does. I'm not trying hard enough to use kingdom language because John's gospel doesn't, but um, in a similar kind of way of being called into something bigger, being called into a mo new movement that's now available to humanity that God is initiating in the world, so. Yeah, I think that as that well ties into life language. Go ahead. 
no, I think that's I think that's an important point, Matt. That, and and particularly for this section of the discourse, of that you're you're getting that abide language here, and how how is it that you can tie that in to the larger themes of the gospel? And this is such a critical uh, description verb of of what that of what that relationship looks like, and it is not a passive. Th this gospel does not assume that kind of passivity. It, it absolutely is predicated on a relationship that is mutual, <laughs> um, that a relationship is not really a relationship if there's not mutual, mutuality and reciprocity. And so that abiding is, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's often gets, uh, of course, translated as remain or stay, but the, but it has a, far more dynamism that uh, that you're pointing out. And the the flesh, you know, the the reference to flesh here, to tie that back to 114, is also a suggestion that that this relationship with Jesus is is a participation in the entirety, a relationship with Jesus that's the entirety of his our incarnated experience. And so it's, uh, it's not just participating in his death or in, in his resurrected life, but it's the entirety of his, uh, uh, of how is it that he is the, this, this flesh human expression of God and, and the, the totality of, of what Jesus experiences. And so we haven't gotten there yet, but his tears in John 11 and his his troubledness in the farewell discourse. And so it's, uh, it, 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 which the use of flesh here then matches, you know, this invitation to eat his flesh is, is, is really that invitation to experience God in a way that, uh, that a God who chose to be fully us. Um, so there's an extraordinary intimacy here that that abiding uh, verb really plays into. I want to talk a bit about the repetition in this passage and the and the development and and spend a little bit of time noting this is week four of five and that this is a, a long passage. Obviously, the sermon title this week, no matter what you are um, preaching about, has to be chew on this for a while. So that's, we don't usually give <laughs> away good. sermons here on, on, on Working Preacher. We're, now we're good. giving away titles. So chew on this for a while. It has to be your sermon title. I want no royalties for that. That's quite all right. Nevertheless, uh, this, in some ways, this passage itself and, and being asked to dwell in the passage or to sit with the passage for five weeks is an exercise in biblical reading. You know, as, it, as John takes this one symbol, this one term, this, you know, and weaves into a bunch of these, connects them to different parts of the Gospels, as you're fond of telling us, uh, reminding us, Caroline, uh, the, the connection within this Gospel, but also just to continue kind of in this spiral, getting closer to the image, looking at it in different ways, which in a lot of ways is what biblical interpretation does, continue to note things, not just the ways in which a text might repeat, but also the ways in which when different interpreters get called around a passage, when different interpreters get called around a biblical symbol, they're going to see different things. Mm -hmm. They're going to find some things more oppressive than, than others might find more liberating. And they're going to find themselves in, addressed in different ways. This is what happens when people gather around texts and gather around ideas. And in some ways, what this chapter is doing, what the lectionary is doing, I think, is calling us to sit for a while. And so it's an interesting opportunity for a preacher to say, you know, usually we get these drive-by passages where, mm -hmm. where is Jesus again? Who's he with? And then he's gone the next week, right? Because of the pace of so many of the gospels. But here we're being asked to sit for a while with a stranger, the author of John, the Johanna and Jesus, whatever you want to call it, and listen to a stranger talk about, well, what if, or what about this? Or have you thought about mm -hmm. this dimension? And that sometimes is boring because it requires an attentiveness. It sometimes makes us want to push back or fight back but it also opens up new worlds. And so there's a way in which I think a preacher can spend some time almost preaching about repetition mm. or preaching about difference 
as a kind of virtue that biblical interpreters need to have, that congregations need to have. Um, and yeah. in doing so, you might discover something about yourselves, but even more so here about Jesus. I really, I really like that. And, and there is, uh, there's a logic to the lectionary here. Um, and, you know, we, we, we are, all three of us have, are open and honest about the benefits of the lectionary and the challenges of the lectionary. That's, that's something that we talk about frequently, but there is an extraordinary logic to the lectionary here that, it ins that it's suggesting that you spend five weeks in this passage. And so in that sense, it's an invitation to what John's gospel invites is this abiding. Uh, the, the repetition is a way to keep you in this text of abiding in the word. Um, if you continue in my word, John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, the truth will set you free, right? And so there is this, that promise of one of, of 8, 31 uh, is kind of ideally what's supposed to happen in these five weeks uh, is, is, uh, is an abiding to see different kinds of truth about who Jesus is. Uh, and in this case, uh, bread that bread that sustains, bread for life, bread that uh, bread that invites relationship. And so, um, I, I, yeah, I think an entry into uh, uh, that uh, an approach to scripture, I think is really appropriate because, um, because you get in John that very invitation of, of, of he, he, John has created a narrative that you can't really get out of. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so. Good. Uh, do we want to say anything? What like Proverbs? Uh, it's uh, you know obviously the connection here is the wisdom has set her table, and so you have the personification of wisdom as uh, as a host, right? A banquet host here, uh, and uh, and you know and verse five come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. I mean, that, that's a great, you know, it's a great connection to obviously the passage. This is the invitation to abide in, in wisdom. And of course, there's many interpretations that connect the logos of John's gospel to the wisdom tradition. So that's probably one of the connections that's being made here. Not that you necessarily have to do that in a sermon, but there is that, that uh, recognition of of God as host, uh, that John's not just making this up, <laughs> uh, but uh, but that that idea of of God um, God preparing a table, God hosting a table, which also is a really important perspective on uh, on communion. If that's a, also a direction that you're going, but other thoughts on Proverbs. Nope. Well, it's be hard. Yeah, it's <laughs> obviously hard to preach it on its own. <laughs> That verse six too, right? Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. And that's that's not using the language of abiding that we see in John, but there's a similarity there too. And this is I as I hear this, this idea of live and walk. Come into a new way of living, mm -hmm. new way of experiencing life. So even eternal life in John does have a sense of temporality, but it's also the sense of quality. Mm -hmm. So even that translation at the end of John, the one who eats his bread will live forever. Mm -hmm. It's all temporal in English, at least as I hear it, but there is a sense in the Greek that this is also about quality. And so, you know, Proverbs offers this life of a different quality, but it also couches it because wisdom is personified, right? She's this host that it's also couched in relationship. So this new mm -hmm. life is a part of relation or coming to know somebody, which of course John picks up. So yeah. I would just turn to Proverbs to amplify John this week. But that's what I would do too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And help people make, I mean, again, it's an exercise in reading uh, in that, you know, the ways in which uh, the ways in which you see the New Testament, I'm not necessarily that John is drawing on Proverbs. That's not what I'm saying, but you see these illusions or these consistencies of, of metaphors and analogies that are themes, biblical themes that, um, that the authors, biblical yeah. authors are, are connecting. So does semi continue? Huh? David, I was just going to say, David has died or dies this Sunday. Sorry, that's yes. in the passage. Yeah, he died like 3,000 years ago, but. Yep. He dies in chapter 2, verse 10 of first, second, first Kings. He does. First, second and Kings. in fact, he dies peacefully. First. As opposed to? At war. 
Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And the clue is slept with his fathers, translated here as ancestors. That's the uh, that's the Hebrew idiom, or at least in the Deuteronomistic history, that's the idiom for mean he died peacefully of old age. Oh, okay. Very helpful. And then um, <laughs> I, you know, I I invite people to go ahead and read the first uh, three chapters of First Kings, so you get uh, at least a, at the very least a different picture of Bathsheba because then they skip right to suddenly Solomon's on the throne and they don't, they don't, uh, the lectionary um, skips the intrigue and it was not a, a done deal. Adonijah was also declared king with Solomon, but then they skip right ahead. They're going to skip right to the wisdom of Solomon. So this is, uh, uh, again, royal, I mean, it feels like royal propaganda uh, in the midst of it all, so that, you know, ask anything you want. I, I'm going to ask for wisdom. I want to ask for money. Ah, since you ask for wisdom, you get money too, right, and fame. And um, so the, uh, this, in, in some ways, the story um, mainly functions to, uh, as two things. One, it moves the story forward. Um, but also what it does is it, um, I suppose it can be, you know, it could be a, uh, a positive role model story at this point in Solomon's life. They skip the negative role model for Solomon at this point of, um, if you could ask for anything you want, what would you ask for? Yeah, so, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Like, you know, what, what, what will you ask for? Right. The, mm -hmm. the, speaking of, speaking of sermon titles. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that, yeah, what it, what is it that if you could ask God for anything, it's kind of like the genie in the bottle, right? If you could mm -hmm. ask God for anything, what, what would that, what would that be? Uh, and I, I think that's a worthwhile question, um, to enter into this text. Uh, you know, isn't it obvious what you'd ask for? I'd ask that Solomon not be king. That's me. Uh, uh, wouldn't you ask for the bread of life? Oh, yes, I would. Ex yes. Exactly. That is exactly what I would have asked for. There yes. There you go. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, I was kind of thinking of a couple other things. But... Yeah. But yeah. now that you reflect on it in now wisdom. Now I reflect on that. Yes. Casting aside immaturity. <laughs> yeah. Again. I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And Psalm 34, which is the response to the Proverbs Old Testament lesson is, you know, um, I think we're, he, we're in Psalm 34 here and next week, which I think is one of those acrostic Psalms. And, um, you know, it's obviously uh, about the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I think that's the, that's the connection. And so you, you know, it, that, that's, that's actually, um, a really powerful image if you step back and just don't just don't mow through it poetically. So the most fearsome beast in the wild, the lion, even the lion suffers one and hunger, but those who seek the Lord, the most, the humble, most powerless um, can seek the Lord and lack no good thing. It's, it's a, it's quite a contrast poetically that I was mm. just thinking about that um, preparing for this morning. And just uh, just a reminder that 34 verse 8 is, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So we have this, right? Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Probably, yeah. which is, again, why didn't they? Well, that was for last week, right? Yeah, so oh, so that, that was last, last week. Yeah, so yeah. we had that So last they're doing week, Psalm so. 34 three weeks in a row then. Yeah, three Sorry. weeks in a row, right. And so you have then some of these connections, of course, to, um, to, the John passage, the bread of life passage, yep. but yeah. All right. And should we move on to Ephesians? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ephesians. So this is our, what, six of seven, something like that. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Yes. Our sixth of seven. And we stop right before the good part, but we've already talked about that. <laughs> I actually love this part, though. Well, it's a fine Perhaps part. You should, you should mm -hmm. say more. Yeah. How do you live? Uh, maybe this is um, 
in some ways, maybe then this goes with, if you're invited to a new way of life, um, how do you live? Uh, well, how do you make the most of time? We are, a, we are a people, we are a species that is obsessed with time, but how do you make uh, the most of the time? Um, sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord. Uh, that is the, the thing they go to is the worship life, but uh, the worship life, the rest of the week. And uh, so it's a life that's filled with praise. Uh, and actually, you know, Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are three different types of, they're, they're not, it's not three sim, uh, synonyms, it's three different types of, of uh, praise songs. But uh, what does that life look like that is filled with praise all the time? Mm -hmm. And what does praise do? You know, um, Mark Colden, uh, our former colleague and dean uh, of blessed memory, uh, he once said in a sermon on this passage, I heard him say, we don't sing these songs because they uh, express what we already mean. We sing these songs so that we would come to mean what they say. And I mm -hmm. think that's, I mean, I really think that's one of the functions of the music of the church. And isn't there also in this phrase, uh, um, although maybe I'm getting it wrong, I mean, uh, that redeeming the time, but that might be a different passage, but I also think making the most of the time because the days are evil. Well, that sounds kind of normal, you know, uh, so surrounded by a world that's uh, in which the days are evil. This is, this is the response. I, I, I uh, if you're tired of the bread of life discourse, this invites a sermon on music and song. Which falls at an interesting time, of course, after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. When congregational singing was one of the most dangerous things people could do. Yeah. And so here you are, you think of certain super spreader events that took place in churches, or there's that one choir rehearsal in Washington State that- Mount Vernon. Got a lot Roger of- Roger Valley, yep. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that look like for congregations that are just starting to come back or are still singing in masks? Um, wondering what this looks like. It, is, it could be a, a poignant text, depending upon how you spend the time and, and where your church is or what your church is still longing to do. And even that invitation to think about time where we've, again, in this last year, how time has been uh, disrupted uh, in sense of time, losing track of days and losing track of, you know, what month are we in, you know, and those memes that were like, yeah, you know, January had 972 days uh, that, that it is an invitation to uh, how, how is it that we, how is it that we are spending our time, but an invitation of time with the Lord. Uh, and 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 what that's made up of, and so I, I think it, you know those those entries into this passage of both um, both a commitment to time to praise, and then uh, a reflection on how is it that we how is it that we spend our time and what we commit our time to uh, would be those are those are those are obviously theological categories that might really resonate with people this week.